Hey everybody, all right, we're moving forward. Uh, remember that the chapter 15 PowerPoint is broken up into two parts. Um, and then we have a kind of third part, which is like some of the reactions of aromatic compounds. And that's going to be my sort of whiteboard, uh, you know, little camcorder style um, recording. So we'll do that also. Hopefully we'll finish this part and then we'll move into, into the other part. So uh, part one of this PowerPoint series, if you remember, was kind of like nomenclature, uh, structure and properties, um, a little bit of molecular orbital theory, which is not really a big deal. We just have to introduce that to you. And then spectroscopic properties, right? Um, the uh, NMR mostly, which you already know. I mean, that's, that's not really new to you. Part two, we're going to talk about um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, and also Huckel's rule, which is a pretty fun uh, rule we use to determine aromaticity of molecules. And like because some, of the, some molecules that kind of look like they'd be aromatic are aromatic, and others are not aromatic. So we will uh, see that in a second, all right? OK, so let's talk about polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons briefly. Um, you've seen some of these probably in your maybe even day-to-day -day life. Um, uh, one of them, one of the PAHs uh, that's pretty common is called naphthalene. Naphthalene. Naphthalene is a fused aromatic ring system, so it's got it's it's called uh, mothballs, um, and it was actually used for the longest time as a way to kill moths. So you put this in your closet, in your in your uh, coats or whatever so that moths don't eat up all your clothing and uh, yeah so it's, these are aromatic compounds and and you have uh, how many how many pi electrons it looks like there's two four six right just like benzene two four six eight ten so there's ten pi electrons and in resonance you know the left ring resonates the right ring resonates and uh, this is uh, one you know, type of these uh, fused aromatic ring systems. And so, yeah, you know, previously they were used as, as mothballs. Um, I think more recently people found out that these are carcinogenic, so they can potentially cause cancer. And I don't think they're used as mothballs anymore, but you might, you know, if you go to <laughs> some old hardware store, you might be able to find them still. Um, little, little white balls because it's a it's a solid it's a solid material okay moths don't like them and moths get a there's a it's kind of like poisonous to moths um, these PAH compounds often have a specific numbering system so naphthalene for example it goes one two three four five six seven eight interestingly the fusion points in the middle are not numbered so this molecule would be called 1,7-dibromonaphthalene. Uh, Does that make sense? 1,7-dibromonaphthalene. In order to understand the naming system, you would need to kind of uh, have this written down or something. And I'm not going to have, have you generate a name or, you know, you don't have to memorize this at all. It's just, you know, you, you need to know that it exists. And if you had to look it up, you could you could probably find the Wikipedia page of naphthalene and see the numbering system. Or even a Google search, naphthalene numbering system, and then you'd see it. See it. Uh, it's not something that people memorize as such. Okay, But generally speaking, the fusion points do not contain numbers. So like this is not, this is not five right here. The five is actually here. Uh, the drug Aleve, it's a uh, sodium naproxen. Um, or naproxen sodium. This is a molecule that actually contains naphthalene as part of the drug. It's a, one of these uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So it's used as a painkiller. It's over the counter. Um, and uh, yeah, so this, isn't, this is not carcinogenic <laughs> and it's, it's metabolized and kind of, you know, works nicely in our body. It doesn't give you cancer, but it uh, inhibits cyclooxygenase, which is one of the um, enzymes that that is involved in inflammation so that's kind of how it works and it is an example of a PAH in a drug here's some more um, 
A lot of these are found in coal tar, and they are very carcinogenic. So a couple of them are anthracene, uh, chrysine, and benzoapyrene. Um, and um, some, of the, some of these actually like intercalate into your DNA. So, you know, your, your DNA uh, alpha helix. And the molecules will kind of sneak into the alpha helix and and attach to the alpha helix, and that's really bad for your your long-term survival as a human, um, and and that is uh, partially why they're carcinogenic. Okay, this just shows how, how a little bit of how it, they actually work. So, like benzopyrene is one of the most carcinogenic PAHs known to uh, known to man, and actually, I think that. It's one of the most carcinogenic substances ever. It's really uh, pretty pretty bad for your body. Um, so what? So the toxicology is understood. Toxicology is the study of how toxic molecules are toxic, right? Anyway, so basically the way it works is not like this is directly carcinogenic, but your body, your liver, metabolizes it. And there's an enzyme system called cytochrome P450 in your liver. That's an oxidizing enzyme system. And so it oxidizes a couple of the carbon atoms on benzopyrene, so you get a dihydroxy group, and you get an epoxide, and we know epoxides are electrophilic. You may not know that DNA is nucleophilic. It's got a lot of nitrogens and lone pairs and things like that, and those are nucleophilic, so nucleophile reacts with electrophile. Oh no, now your DNA is attached to benzopyrene, and that causes mutation, and you know, it affects all your all your gene gene expression, and uh, and that you know does, is not a guarantee that you're going to get cancer, but it it usually well it, it it often leads to cancer. Definitely in this in this substance, it does lead to cancer, and that's why it's considered a human carcinogen. A lot of molecules do this, and you know we we try to avoid intake of carcinogens. And generally speaking, benzopyrene is something we we usually don't ingest. Benzopyrene is found in cigarette smoke um, in you know low concentrations, but it's like one of the, the molecules that people think might cause cancer uh, in from from smoking. Okay, benzene does this too. Um, so benzene is a, it's a com common solvent. It's like twenty percent of gasoline. So y you actually probably if you drive a car, you're probably exposing yourself to a little bit of benzene here and there. But also cytochrome P450 makes an epoxide, DNA attaches, and then now you have basically benzene attached to your DNA, and that also, uh, you know, leads to mutations and uh, uh, cancer. For that reason, in the lab, you know, if you're if you need benzene for a reaction or something, it's it's a nice solvent. I mean, we 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 do use benzene, but you have to be really careful with it. It's often replaced with toluene, and toluene is methyl benzene, and it has a lot of the same properties. And you know, it's a nice, nice solvent. The cool thing about toluene is when it reacts with cytochrome P450, it makes the benzo benzoic acid, a carboxylic acid, and this is not toxic, and it's excreted. This is actually part of some foods and some drugs have benzoic acid in them and so, so this is actually you know I, an ideal metabolite and and this is not toxic the way benzene is okay so now we're going to talk about Huckel's rule to predict aromaticity all right so before we talk about Huckel's rule Let's review some of the properties of aromatic compounds like benzene. All right. Um, so, what are some of the properties of aromatic compounds? One is they are not very reactive um, uh, to simple electrophiles, um, the way like alkenes are, because we know alkenes react with simple simple electrophiles. We know alkynes react with simple electrophiles, right? So alkenes and alkynes do react with electrophiles. Uh, 
And but you you know we'll see that you can react with what I call super electrophiles. So super activated electrophiles, benzene will react with. Okay, they're not easily hydrogenated, so you can't easily just take H2 and palladium, right? H2 palladium, which re reduces an alkene. It doesn't it does not directly reduce an aromatic. You need to use special catalysts like rhodium you know, that that are super activated for hydrogenation. Um, all the bond lengths are the same, right? All the bond lengths are the same. The structure is planar, so benzene is just a planar molecule. What's what about the NMR? The NMR is highly deshielded, right? Seven to eight ppm. Okay. What's the structure of benzene? It's six member ring, alternating single and double bonds, right? But in resonance, it's like the there's like a pi cloud. All all of the double bonds are in resonance, right? Okay, we know that. So in 1931, uh, Eric Huckel asked, do all cyclic pi conjugated compounds possess aromatic st stability, which is like the, the stability that um, benzene has, right? And you might say, yeah, that makes sense, right? Just to have a bunch of cyclic, a cyclic molecule with a bunch of single and double bonds, and they're all gonna be equally stable, right? But it's not the case. And it kind of depends on how many electrons we have in the ring, okay? So, here's some molecules, all right? We got cyclobutadiene, which is a four-member ring with two alkenes, cyclobutadiene. We got benzene. We have cyclooctatetraene which is a eight member ring with four alkenes, right? Cyclo, octa, tetraene. This molecule is kind of weird. It's uh, 18, what do you think 18 means? It's the number of at carbon atoms, right? It's an 18 member ring. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and I started on this one, so one. So that's what the 18 means. 18 anulene is just a, a large ring with a bunch of double bonds in it. So it turns out that some compounds possess this thing called aromatic stability. So they're stable, not super reactive. Um, and they have all the properties that benzene has, the aromatic uh, NMR shifting, basically. Um, just like general stability, right? Okay, so the so Huckel developed a rule called the 4n plus 2 rule to identify aromatic compounds. What does 4n plus 2 mean? And I'll give you a hint. Benzene obeys this rule. Okay, so 4n plus 2 means that like if n is an integer, like 1, 2, 3, right? That if a compound has 4n plus 2 electrons, with n being an integer, and there's a couple other requirements, but you know, basically just double bonds and single bonds in a, in a ring. If it's got four n plus two rules, it's gonna, we're gonna call it aromatic. We're gonna call it aromatic, and benzene's a great example of that. Four n plus two, right? Um, we're gonna see that then there's other compounds that do not have four n plus two, and then there's gonna be two classifications. They're gonna be, ca they're gonna be called anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic, okay? So, and we'll talk about those in a second. But think about cyclobutadiene. How many pi electrons are there? Is it 4n plus two, or is it maybe 4n? Well, there's two here, two there is four, right? D does four electrons match 4n plus two? Uh, not if n's an integer, right? <laughs> right, okay. So, let's see, let's go to the next slide. So Huckel's 4n plus 2 rule um, is um, basically what it, what it predicts is that there's, there's aromatic compounds and they contain 4n plus 2 electrons. So that could be like, what does that mean, 4n plus 2? That could mean like 6, 10, or 14 as, as an example, right? And then there's also these molecules that are called anti-aromatic, and those contain 4n pi electrons. So those that could be like 4, 8, 12, right? Does that make sense? The difference between 4n plus 2, where n is an integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? Or 0. n could be 0. 
that would mean it'd have two pi electrons. We'll see that. Or if you know, for anti-aromatic, it would be like four, eight, twelve, etc. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Aromatic compounds are predicted to have special stability and experience deshielding in, in proton NMR. So you, you aromatic will have these kind of properties. Okay. Um, Anti-aromatic compounds are predicted to be unstable, super unstable, super unhappy, almost explosive, but, but very, they just want to degrade. They don't want to be anti-aromatic. It's like a very unstable class of molecules. And they're not expected to be extensively deshielded either for anti-aromatic. So aromaticity has this stability and deshielding effect. Anti-aromatic are unstable and not extensively deshielded. Okay, and then there's a third class of molecules. I already told you what they were a second ago, right? I said there's aromatic, anti-aromatic, and what's the third one? Any guesses? It's called non-aromatic. So non-aromatic and anti-aromatic are different. All right, so non-aromatic either are not planar, so for aromatic and anti-aromatic, they have to be planar. Like three-dimensionally, they have to be like a, a flat molecule, right? Um, alternatively, non-aromatic do not contain contiguous sp2 centers, right? Contiguous sp2. So you need sp2 centers all around. What if you got an sp3 somewhere? Like in the ring, you got an sp3. Could it be aromatic or anti-aromatic if you have an sp3 somewhere? No, it can't. It has that'll automatically make it non-aromatic. Non-aromatic, basically, all the double bonds act like alkenes. It's not super unstable, but it's not stable either. All right. Anti-aromatic are very unstable. Aromatic are very stable, right? And um, and they have the deshielding effect. Non-aromatic are just kind of like a bunch of alkenes, and they just don't really have any special properties, okay? But we, we need to be able to s distinguish aromatic from anti-aromatic from non-aromatic, all right? Cool. All right, so cyclobutadiene. Cyclobutadiene. Is this aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? What do you think? Um, so how many electrons are there? Uh, is it 4n or 4n plus 2, right? And there's like two there. I'm talking about pi electrons, right? So we got two there, two there. That's 4. Does that match 4n or does that match 4n plus 2? So if it's 4 electrons, that seems like it matches 4n, right? 4 where n equals 1, right? And is this a, this is a small molecule? This is a really tiny molecule, right? Do you think that... Um, this will achieve planarity, I guess. It's like that. The, so the the bi thing we'll see in a second is that as, as the rings get larger, um, it might bend out of plane, and then it won't be anti-aromatic. We're starting to think this must be anti-aromatic, right? It's got to be anti-aromatic. You got four n electrons, and it's really tiny, so it's going to be planar, right? It's going to be a tiny little ring with four n electrons. That's anti-aromatic, right? So it's four pi electrons, and it's, it's anti-aromatic due to the small ring size. The question is going to be, you know, what's going to be the cutoff size between anti-aromatic and non-aromatic? And the cutoff's about seven carbons or so. So we'll we'll see that in a second. All right. So the consequences of being anti-aromatic are th this stuff's really unstable. Um, we don't really talk about this thing called the Diels-Alder reaction. You may learn about it in the lab, but we, we skip that chapter just due to time, essentially. Um, the Diels-Alder reaction, in a nutshell, uh, creates cyclohexenes. So it's like it builds a six-member ring with an alkene, and there's something called a diene, which is a diene, right? It's a, a pair of alkenes. And there's something that that's called the dienophile, dienophile which is the thing that the lover of the diene is basically a electron withdrawing alkene. Anyway, so th this kind of concerted reaction occurs. Um, 
Now, cyclobutadiene is very unstable and re really reactive, and it, it, it will undergo a Diels-Alder reaction as a dienophile. Normally, you need like an ester or something, like a ketone or aldehyde or something like that to cause this to activate the dienophile. But this is so reactive that it doesn't even need that. It just it doesn't like being cyclobutadiene because it's anti-aromatic and unhappy. So this reaction go, uh, undergo you know is uh, it happens very rapidly, right? To the Diels-Alder reaction, you don't need to know about the Diels-Alder reaction because we're not talking about it because um, uh, we're not covering chapter fourteen. All right. Anyway, bottom line, super reactive, super reactive. And all, this is another weird thing about cyclobutadiene is it, unlike benzene, it actually equilibrates between like short bond, long bond, short bond, long bond, and long bond, and, and uh, long bond, short bond, long bond, short bond. The bonds kind of equilibrate in their sizes, lengths. Benzene doesn't do that. Benzene is, uh, you know, all the bonds are equivalent, right? So. Uh, this is kind of an equilibrium, whereas in benzene, it's, in, it's actually in resonance. This is actually in equilibrium. All right, so what about this one? Cyclooctatetraene. Is it aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? And how many electrons are there, pi electrons? Well, we got two, four, six, eight, right? Does that match 4n or 4n plus 2? Does that match 4n or 4n plus 2? And of course it matches 4n, so you might immediately think, oh, it must be anti-aromatic, right? Just like the last one was anti-aromatic, right? But it has this issue, because it's, it's a larger ring, and the, the larger rings can kind of bend out of anti-aromaticity, that makes sense. So it, molecules don't want to be anti-aromatic, right? And if they can bend, they're large enough, if they can bend, then um, they will not be anti-aromatic, but they'll be non-aromatic. It's definitely not aromatic because it doesn't have 4n plus 2, right? So it's, de it's either going to be anti-aromatic or non-aromatic. So it's got 8 pi electrons, but it's non-planar. And we say kind of uh, above, like 7 or above carbon atoms, uh, would be uh, would make it uh, be um, uh, non-aromatic as opposed to anti-aromatic, right? All right, so it's kind of larger, larger ring size. It's going to bend away from planarity, and it's going to become non-aromatic because it doesn't want to be anti-aromatic, right? If this was locked in a plane, if it somehow is planar, like it was a planar molecule, which you can't do because it doesn't want to do that it would be anti-aromatic. But by bending, it becomes, it kind of bends away from planarity. It sort of bends a bit, and now it is non-aromatic. So it bends itself out of the plane to avoid anti-aromaticity. I'll show a model of this in a second, too. Consequences, it kind of just reacts like alkenes, right? It's like four alkenes, they're easily hydrogenated brominated, oxidized, maybe MCPBA, or, you know, those kind of uh, things will react with it, and and basically they're just a bunch of alkenes, right? The NMR is not where aromatic stuff comes. It's roughly at 5, 5.6, which is where alkenes come, right? Where do aromatic compounds come? Like 7, 7, 8, right? D-shielded. So this is D-shielded as well, but it's more deshielded like a normal alkene and not like an aromatic ring. All right, what about this weird one? 18 anulene. 18 anulene. All right, so is it aromatic, anti aromatic, or non aromatic? And well, 18 uh, is the number of uh, carbons. Let's count the number of pi electrons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So 18 also, it's the number of carbons and it's also the number of electrons, right? 18. All right, so is 18, does 18 match 4n plus 2 or 4n? 
So 18, I don't know. Hmm. Because like 4n, think about 4n real quick. Like 4, 4n, where n is 4, n, that means 4 times 4 is 16, right? So anti-aromatic would be like 16 electrons, but this is not 16, it's 18. So maybe it matches the 4n plus 2 rule, Huckel's rule, and then it would be 18, 18 electrons, right? And so with the 18 electrons, and they're all contiguous, sp2, right? Every one of those is like an alkene, right? So they're all sp2. Um, those, that, that, those are the requirements for aromaticity. So it's 18 pi electrons, which is 4 times 4 plus 2. 16 plus 2 is 18. Totally aromatic. Totally aromatic, OK? Um, consequences. It's non-reactive. It's relatively stable. It's a highly planar structure, highly planar. It wants to be planar because if it's planar, it it maintains this aromatic stability. It's like it 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 kind of you know it'll it'll um, being planar is a is a desirable geometry of it because it's aromatic. And aromatic is a, a ideal state for a structure. The NMR is pretty cool for this one. Um, the external protons are 9.28. So those are like extra deshielded, right? Or extra, because normal aromatic, seven or eight, right? Seven or eight. So these are like crazy shielded, crazy deshielded on the outside. But this molecule also has inside protons, inside protons, right? It's got protons in the inside. And where do they come? They are insanely shielded. So shielded they go off the scale. They're at negative 3 ppm, which is pretty cool. Um, so there's a problem in the book, and there's also a figure. And, and, and just to kind of review, what, you know, why, did it, why was aromatic deshielded in the beginning? Um, I have, uh, well, I, I showed you this figure, right? Oh, actually, wait. Actually, we'll come back to that, all right? So we'll come back to the... Um, the 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 de-shielding and shielding behavior of this one in a sec. So we're going to do a pseudo quiz. It's not a real quiz, so don't worry about <laughs> sending me this. Questions: aromatic, anti, or non? A aromatic, anti, or non? So this one, 14 anilin. What do you think? Well, the 14 also refers to you know it's the number of carbons, but also the number of pi electrons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, right? Does that match 4n or 4n plus 2? Four, uh, 14, it would probably be 4 times 3 is 12, right? Integer plus 2 is 14, right? And it, uh, the contiguous sp2, right? Contiguous sp2. That means every carbon is sp2. There's no sp3 centers here. So is it aromatic, anti aromatic, or non aromatic? What do you think? Uh, probably going to be aromatic, right? Okay. S indesine. I don't know what the S stands for, but indesine is a it's a weird molecule. How many pi electrons do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve electrons, pi electrons. You, what do you think? Aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? 12 electrons. So is that 4n plus 2 or 4n? 12. It's probably 4 times 3, right? So it can't be aromatic. Can't be aromatic. So now the question is, is it anti-aromatic or non-aromatic? Well, the ring size, you look at, look at the ring sizes, and these are 5 and 6. That's actually pretty, sm these are small. These are small uh, ring sizes. And so it's going to be forced to be planar. The ri small ring size kind of forced planarity. If it's forced to be planar and it's got four in electrons, what is it? Ar anti or non? Should be anti aromatic, right? This is an unstable molecule. Azulene, azulene. How many pi electrons? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10. Hmm, 10 electrons is 4n or 4n plus 2? 10 electrons is 4n or 4n plus 2. Well, it looks like that's that's aromatic, right? 10 would be 
2 times 4 plus 2, right? So that's uh, aromatic compound. Cyc 1, 4 cyclohexadiene. So this is a six member ring, pair of alkenes. You might think, oh, how many pi electrons? 1, 2, 3, 4, right? 4. Hmm, that matches the anti aromatic rule, right? So is this anti aromatic or non aromatic? Well, you, and you see the small ring size, you're like, oh, yeah, anti aromatic, right? Totally anti aromatic. But what's another requirement again of anti aromatic? What kind of hybridization on every carbon? It has like sp2, 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 sp2. Well, these are not sp2. These are CH2 groups, and they are sp3, right? It's tetrahedral. So this is this is uh, non-aromatic. Can't be anti-aromatic if you got sp2. Uh, sorry, sp3 centers in it. Pentaline, pentaline, weird molecule. Okay, so it's got one, two. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it's 8 electrons. Matches 4n or 4n plus 2. 8 electrons should match 4n, right? And, but then is it, it's either anti-aromatic or non-aromatic. And the question then comes down to contiguous sp2 centers. Yeah, we got contiguous sp2 centers. Everything's sp2, right? They're all alkene carbons, basically. And is it a big ring in that it can like bend over and become non-aromatic? No, those are tiny rings. Those are fi five member rings can't contort in a way that would make it them um, non-aromatic. So this one is anti-aromatic. All right. Let's, let's look at this molecule 18 annually and again and the NMR of it right that big huge molecule that we said outside was like 9 ppm and the inside was negative 3 ppm so outside was deshielded inside was shielded right remember that okay so this this is we, we saw this in the NMR chapter a few a few chapters ago and we, we kind of talked about, you know, why, why is benzene deshielded? Why is benzene, normal old benzene, why is benzene deshielded? Remember, our, our reasoning was that there's a, a kind of like an uh, outside magnetic field that's, that's kind of creating a circulating motion or like a ring current. And so with the outside magnetic field, which is kind of pushing the electrons, they loop or the, the electrons kind of loop from the outside and around, right? And like if in the, the middle of the ring is kind of shielded, it's the, the, the looping effect of the elect electron cloud kind of shields the inside of the benzene, right? It shields the, the inside of the benzene from the effect of the magnetic field, right? But, the, but that loop continues around, it continues around and the outside, the protons on the on the benzene, are not shielded. They're actually deshielded, right? Remember that? That was we did that. That's how we explained why are the protons on the outside, you know, of a benzene, why why are they deshielded? Well, this is why, right? The inside is shielded. The outside is deshielded, right? So, and they're you know they're pretty far deshielded. There's like seven ppm, right? That's you know uh, for an air, for a Organic molecule that's pretty deshielded, right? They come in their own little spot, seven to eight ppm, and that's they're deshielded, right? And but but a benzene doesn't have any CHs in the middle, right? There's no CHs in the middle of a benzene. It's just the pr the protons on the outside, right? And those are deshielded. So what about this molecule? Aha! What did we say? The outside are very very deshielded, right? So deshielded, it's even more than the benzene. Benzene's like seven to eight. These we said on the outside were nine. So it's like a sig more significant effect of um, a crazy molecule like this. But now, in the middle 
of this molecule, we actually have CHs, right? There's a CH, 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 there's a CH. Whole bunch of CHs. I think there's six probably, right? One, two, three, four, five, six CHs on the inside. And where do those come? Those are, where do we say? Outside was nine. Inside, negative three. So they're very shielded. They're off the scale shielded negative 3 ppm, which is, you've never seen it, something that shielded before. But you've never seen a weird molecule like this either, right? Anyway, that's kind of cool. And, and that's, that's the reasoning for why the outside is de-shielded, the inside is shielded. And it comes down to this sort of theory of benzene de-shielding that we talked about in the NMR chapter. Um, mini tangent real quick. Uh, I have a, I have a computer program that does a little bit of 3D modeling. Uh, it's, it's a, it's not a super good program, but it, but it shows me a couple things I want to, um, bring up real quick. Um, so like this benzene, right? You can't see the double bonds and single bonds, but the structure is, uh, delocalized, right? There's a lot of, you know, there's six electrons in benzene. What's the geometry of benzene? It's, is it planar or is it bent? Yeah, it looks kind of uh, planar, right? So we know benzene's aromatic. What I want to show you is a couple of the other weird molecules that we mentioned earlier, like, whoops, like cyclobutadiene. That was four n uh, eight uh, two four electrons, right? Two two and one two and the other. So it's, it's anti-aromatic. What I'm trying to show is, yeah, it's planar, right? It's not like it can't be non-planar. <laughs> it can't really bend itself into non-planarity. And so we said it's it's four electrons, and it is aromatic or anti or non. We said it's anti, right? Well, it's because it's planar and it's got four electrons, right? Okay, so what are the other ones? Cyclooctatetraene. Remember that one? It looks like a stop sign. Stop sign, it was like two, four, six, eight, and it was eight, ele um, two, four, six, eight electrons, right? That was not anti-aromatic, even though it's four N electrons, and that's because it bends itself. It does this weird bending thing because it, it's trying to avoid anti-aromaticity. So the structure bends itself out of planarity, and that's why it kind of looks a little bent. And when it's bent, it can't be anti-aromatic, right? So these larger rings with 4n electrons are not anti-aromatic, they're non-aromatic. So this is non-aromatic. All right, so what's the other one? Uh, I got uh, butadiene. Octa, uh, 18 aniline. This is that big one. The one we were just showing with NMR. Now you can totally see the outside protons, which have the the uh, negative or the 9 ppm chemical shift in NMR. Super down downfield. Super deshielded. And then these are the weird ones in the middle, and they they experience that shielding effect in the proton NMR, so they come at, at negative three ppm, okay? But it's a, it's a planar molecule, very nice and planar, right? And then what other one? Pentylene, we just showed this one. This had eight electrons, I think. Uh, uh, two, four, two, four, six, eight electrons. So it was, it was just anti-aromatic, right? And it's, it's locked in a planar structure because the rings are small, right? So this is a cool example of seeing a, uh, uh, you know, small rings, four n electrons, contiguous sp2 centers, uh, makes it anti-aromatic. Okay. Um, there's a couple other classes of these sort of molecules that we should talk about. First of all, and book talks about these two. Um, aromatic anions. Hmm, aromatic anion. What's an anion? It's something with a dot dot negative, right? It's negatively charged. Well, this molecule first 
is not an anion, not an anion. Um, and the question is: Is it aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? Aromatic, anti, or non? What do you think? So you might start with the double bonds, pi electrons. Two plus two is four, right? You're like, oh, four electrons, right? But then you're so four electrons, definitely not aromatic. It's either anti or non. So what is it? Which of those is it? Is it anti-aromatic or non-aromatic? What do you think? Um, and the big question might be, are you, do you have contiguous sp2? And you don't because that's a sp3, right? So can't be anti, can't be aromatic, it has to be non-aromatic. Okay. So, th but if we use a base and we take off this proton, we, we use a base and take off this proton, then now we have an anion, right? A dot dot negative. And this actually, the lone pair counts as a pair of electrons. Uh, this also uh, changes the hybridization. So this is sp3. This becomes sp2. So now we got sp2 all around. And how many electrons are there? Pi electrons. Well, you got two in the lone pair, two in this double bond, and two in this double bond. So that's what six, right? Just like a benzene, right? Just like a benzene. Benzene has six. So this is what we call an aromatic anion. Um, this has, yeah, so this is aromatic. It's an anion that's aromatic. It's a very stable molecule. It's super stable. The, when we say conjugate base, what is that? What does that mean? Is it the left molecule or the right molecule? Conjugate base. It's the right molecule, right? When you have an acidic proton and we tick off the proton and it makes a conjugate base, um, it makes a conjugate base. Um, this is stable, right? It's aromatic, so it's as stable as you can get. So this is a super favored reaction, right? And what's that going to do to the acidity of this CH2? It's, does it make it more acidic or less acidic? If, if, you're, if you're forming a stable conjugate base, will that enhance the acidity or like de-enhance it or whatever, right? What do you think? It's actually quite acidic. It's it's very acidic. Fifteen, right? Because what if what if it was just cyclopentane, right? The five five embering. So five em I can't draw it easily right now, but imagine cyclopentane, right? It's carbon, 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 carbon. Five carbons, right? Cyclopentane, no double bonds. What's the pKa of cyclopentane? What do you think? Big number, small number. Cyclopentane. It is so incredibly non-acidic. It's like 60, pKa of 60, right? This is, like, and if you think about like, like, you know, the meaning of pKa, it's exponential, right? So if cyclopentane, which I'm just imagining right over here, cyclopentane, if it's 60 and this is 15, how much more acidic is this? It's not, it's not like 60 minus 15, right? That's like, what, 35, 45, I think? It's not 40, this is not 45 times more acidic. It's 10 to the 45 times acidic, because it's exponential, right? What's 10 to the 45? Like, can you write that in that number on your paper? It's one followed by 45 zeros. One and 45 zeros, right? That's how much more acidic this is than like cyclopentane. So this is insanely acidic. And why is it so insanely acidic? It's because the conjugate base is so happy because it's an aromatic anion, right? Anyway, so this is one of these examples of an ar aromatic ion. Um, yeah, cyclopentadienyl anion is aromatic. Uh, if you're in the lab course, Chem 336, I guess. There's an experiment where they talk about ferrocene. You can you Wikipedia search that. Ferrocene, F-E-R-R-O-C-E-N-E, ferrocene. So it's basically like an iron sandwich. It's like the, you have two of these are the bread of the sandwich, and then you have an iron in the middle. <laughs> so like it's like cyclopentadienyl anion. Like one of the one of these iron, and then another one. It's like it forms a, like a sandwich complex. 
and it's a it's a stable complex with iron and, and you guys do a reaction with it chem 336 so you'll you'll see that in that uh, lab experiment okay how about aromatic cations what's the difference between an anion and a cation well an anion is negative a cation is positive right so this one this molecule first is this aromatic anti-aromatic or non-aromatic aromatic anti-aromatic anti or non-aromatic well, you count the double bonds and electrons, you're like, well, there's two, four, six. Does that match 4n or 4n plus 2? It's 4n plus 2, right? Just like a benzene, right? Okay, and just like a benzene, right? So is it aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non? Well, it's the same issue with the CH2. So that's sp3, and if it's sp3, it can't be anything but non-aromatic. All right. So this, you don't use a base. Well, we actually, the way to do this now is use uh, Br2, bromine. So br this, is, this is actually the first reaction you learn in organic wine. It's like radical bromination. Radical bromination, right? This is a very activated position for radicals. Um, Brominate, you get a Br. The Br will actually just spontaneously fall off and take its electrons with it. Now you have a plus charge, okay? Now you have contiguous sp2 centers. Contiguous sp2, okay? So we have six electrons, six pi electrons, contiguous sp2. So is this now, this molecule, is it aromatic, anti, or non? Well, it's got the six electrons and there's sp2 all around. And even large ring systems, they want to be aromatic. They, do, they don't want to be anti. Well, if you have four n electrons, they'll bend away from anti, right? But if you have four n plus two, that's desirable. This is actually a desirable structure. This is aromatic. It's an aromatic cation, an aromatic cation, okay? So this is uh, the products in aromatic stabilized carbocation with multiple resonance structures, right? And you could draw the resonance structures of this. Double bond chases after the plus charge. So double bond attack, double bond, you know, you could form, draw some multi multiple resonance structures. Totally stable, totally happy molecule. And then one more, kind of weird one like this. Aromatic dianion. Okay, wh what's this? Is this aromatic, anti, or non? Well, we saw this earlier. We saw it earlier, right? What is it? It's how many how many pi electrons? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's eight is four n, not not four n plus two. But this one is weird because of the size, and so it's eight, making you think anti-aromatic. But it bends, like I showed you the model. It bends, so it's actually non-aromatic, right? So this is an interesting one where if you treat this with potassium. Uh, it does a, a kind of a reduction type thing, and you get a dianion. So you have dot dot negative dot dot negative. So dianion. Now, how many pi electrons? Well, and it's at, everything's sp2 now. Still, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so ten is aromatic, right? Four n plus two. So this is a uh, what we call a aromatic dianion because it's got two. Uh, sorry, uh, 4n plus 2 electrons, and and so this is this is kind of like it's another it's another stable dianion structure. These are used in like like uh, inorganic chemistry as a ligand, like it, it attaches to a metal, for example. So you might see these kind of weird cyclo octa di. I don't know what even it's called. It's a cy cyclo octa triene dianion maybe something like that but these are used to like complex metals and stuff so you might have a metal with a plus two charge and this has a minus two charge and they form a little complex like an inorganic complex that's kind of a lot what a lot of these things are used for it's an aromatic dianion okay. uh, I think we're done with the PowerPoint now we're gonna jump into the little pseudo whiteboard thing All right, now we're moving on to a little bit of the reactivity of uh, benzene molecules. Okay, so 
I think what we did in PowerPoint was roughly one through six, were the different points. We're, we're still in chapter 15. Benzene and aromaticity. Um, chapter 16, remember, will be a, a follow-up chapter with a little bit more on aromatic chemistry. But we did one through six in PowerPoint. Now we're on to the reactions. So this is no, first one is number seven. So number seven is kind of like the general type of reactivity that all the benzene derivatives have. So we see it's synthesis of uh, benzene derivatives. Synthesis of benzene derivatives uh, via the general class of reactions uh, are called electrophilic, aromatic, substitution. Electrophilic aromatic substitution. And maybe a good abbreviation should be what do you think? What's a good abbreviation? Acronym. EAS. Okay. So we're going to do a lot of EAS. E Electrophilic aromatic substitution. They all have very similar mechanisms. Um, recall, let's go think back a couple chapters of how electrophilic addition to alkenes works. Because it'll be kind of similar to aromatic, but a little different. All right, electrophilic addition to alkenes. Um, remember, how did that work? Like if we have an alkene and react with HBr, what's the end? We get um, essentially this, right? Right. That's that's the that's the product of this reaction with HBr. What's the mechanism of this? Think back. Chapter 12. It's not that hard. Uh, it's a very simple mechanism. Is it alkene attacks proton and kicks off a Br, right? And then what does that make? What's the intermediate? We add, we add an H to the least substituted side. And what, what happens on the more substituted side? Like where the Br is going to be? What is it? It's a uh, I'll give you a hint. Uh, the byproduct's Br minus, right? So if it's neutral plus neutral makes neutral, right? Neutral plus neutral makes neutral. And then this intermediate should be something plus something should be neutral, right? If this is negative, what's the charge of this? Right? It's Think back from organic one, with the charge of the central carbon. Something plus negative is neutral. This must be positive, right? It's a carbocation. Remember that? Carbocation. So that's that was from chapter 12 or something. So chapter 12. Chapter 12. Okay, cool. All right, so yeah. What's the second part of the mechanism? Nucleophilic attack of the Br. And... You get your product. All right, cool. So this is old. this is old. What if we were giving the describing these two steps in words? We'd say one's A and one's B. So A is uh, we'll say the substrate, which means the alkene in this case. The substrate attacks an electrophile. What's the electrophile? It's the uh, H HBr, right? HBr. And the second step is nucleophile, which is the Br minus. The nucleophile attacks the substrate. And carbocation in this case. Carbocation. Okay, cool. So that's, we got that. All right, that's, that's old chapter 12 alkene stuff, right? All right, so with benzene, the first step, it'll be the first step and then a, second, a, a, a different second step. There's basically going to be 
the benzene is going to attack an electrophile and then a different second step happens. All right, so. Let's draw these steps. For aromatics, for aromatic compounds, first of all, they are less reactive. They do the same thing, but they're less reactive, right? Because they're happy aromatic compounds. So we need what I call a super electrophile. It's not just any electrophile, it's a super electrophile. So something happens that um, makes it a little more super, right? A little more, a more, super, more reactive electrophile. So generally speaking though, you got like a benzene, when you react it with your super electrophile, Super E plus, it's extra reactive. What's going to happen is you're going to get the electrophile will be incorporated into the benzene. Super electrophile. Okay, so what's the different? How, how is this going to be a little different from alkene chemistry? Well, the first thing is that the double bond attacks, just like with alkenes, right? So the benzene attacks the super electrophile. What does that give us? Remember, where are protons like here? On every carbon, right? We have they're all six CHs, right? I'm not drawing them, but they're there, right? So I'm going to put the E right there. All right. So far, so good, yeah. And what else? What? And, and that's this double bond does the attack. So let's. I even circle the double bond. I'm going to draw this actually a little, little nicer. I'm going to erase it and. Make it nice and clear. Let's redraw this benzene. Double bond, double bond, double bond. I recommend draw the double bonds the same way as I drew. And I'm going to just say, kind of like this pair of electrons attacked, right? And I'm putting the electrophile on this carbon. So when we're drawing this intermediate, what? how do we fill in everything else? Because there's some stuff that changed and there's some stuff that did not change. Like what else did not change? Like that left double bond didn't change. It's still there, right? So let's put that in there. The left double bond's there, right? What other did, things did not change as the double bond attacked? Well, this one didn't change, right? But this is gone now. So the double bond's gone because it went and reacted with the super electrophile. All right. Um, and what else? What else can I draw if I if I want to? It's like, well, you know, what what other stuff is on this carbon? Like this carbon, is there anything else on it? Any other atoms? Any other atoms? I mean, we said it earlier. Every carbon has an H, so this carbon's got an H, right? I'll just put it there. Okay, there it is. All right. Anything else? And you know, thinking back on the last page, we were talking about alkenes. You know. What can I draw on this carbon, on the, the neighboring carbon, this, this neighboring carbon, which I draw there? Well, there, of course there is an H. I'll draw the H. Why not? Here's the H. Anything else? Charges. What's the charge of this neighboring carbon? Just like on the last, last page. It is also, it's plus. Okay, cool. All right, so... Alk the benzene, it's not an alkene, but it is, you know, it kind of acts like an alkene, but it's an aromatic, uh, this double bond in this aromatic molecule attacks. You get this, and then what was the next step when we were doing alkene chemistry a second ago, right? The next step would be 
something attacks the plus charge, right? Something attacks the plus charge. But that's not what happens with benzene. With benzene, a mild base um, takes this proton, and so we're not we're not going to attack with a nucleophile. We're just going to take a proton off, and now we're, we return back to this this molecule, and this is the final product. Okay. We'll explain why it does that in a second, but. Um, let's like we did on the last page. Let's let's write this out in words. We have A and B. It's a two-step process, right? So step A was what? Step A, the benzene or aromatic ring, AR aromatic ring does what? The tax the super electrophile or the yes E plus whatever super super electrophile and this. Does this have an effect on the aromaticity? Because that's definitely aromatic, right? That's a benzene. It's aromatic. Is this aromatic anymore? This was aromatic. Is this aromatic? This was aromatic, right? Benzene's aromatic. Is this aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? Aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? Because it's got some pi electrons and stuff, but you see the sp3 center there. It's got an sp3 center, right? Does that make it aromatic, anti, or non? It's, it's non-aromatic. Non-aromatic. And then this is aromatic again. Right? Alright, so as step A happens, we go from aromatic to non-aromatic, or we can say it's called de-aromatization. De-aromatization. Does it want to be de-aromatized or non-aromatic? It doesn't. It, so th this, my point is that this this will happen, but you're making something that's very unhappy and it wants to return to the aromatic world, right? So we're de-aromatizing, and then the next step is loss of proton, right? And how, what's the name for that? If this is, we're de-aromatizing, and then we're going back to aromatic, I like to say we're re-aromatizing. De-aromatization followed by re-aromatization. Okay? Yeah, cool. So, that's essentially the EAS reaction. This EAS. Air, electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. We're going to see a bunch of examples of this now. All right. Let's talk about the intermediate cation. Which is this? This is the intermediate cation. So note about intermediate cation. One more, th one more thing, real quick. I'm going to jump back to the alkene slide that I just showed you. Okay, remember this? We we're just talking about this a second ago. Alkenes react with HBr, and then, and then it's like you, you uh, protonate, and then you make a carbocation, and then the nucleophile attacks, right? Then the nucleophile attacks the plus charge, and you get the product, right? That was kind of like chapter 12, right? Why doesn't it do that here? Why, do, why don't we just have a nucleophile attack the plus charge? Like Br minus or I don't know, whatever. Something attack the plus charge. Why does it, why, why does it do this where it grabs the proton and, and makes a remix uh, double bond? Right? Why doesn't X minus some kind of nucleophile attack this? Because if it did that, it would stay non-aromatic. That's why. By taking the proton off, it's re-aromatizing and returning to happy aromatic world. Okay, that's why. That's why we do de-aromatization and re-aromatization. Okay, one, one second. Yeah. All right. So about this intermediate cation, let's talk about this stuff. The, the middle part. 
first thing, what do we say about the nature of the uh, of it? Is, is it aromatic or it's it's non-aromatic, right? It's non-aromatic. So the intermediate is non-aromatic. Um, and why do how do we know it's non-aromatic? It's it's got four pi electrons, right? One, two, three, four. Which you'd maybe think it makes it anti-aromatic, but the big thing is it contains an sp3 center, and by containing an sp3 center, you'd say, oh well, that's definitely non-aromatic, all right? Okay, so. But there is some, uh, some, even though it's not aromatic, it is somewhat resonance stabilized. So let's draw that. So it is uh, resonance stabilized, not like enough uh, to make it like aromatic, but it has some resonance stabilization. So let's let's draw some of the resonance stabilization. So I'm going to redraw that molecule. Alright, so we have an E, that's the electrophile, we have the H, we got a plus charge. Alright, so how is this resonance stabilized? Well, just, I don't know, we can do this. When we're drawing resonance of positively charged molecules, we, we, I usually take my double bonds and I chase after the plus charge, right? When it's negatively charged resonance, like a negatively charged molecule, I usually use the negative charge to chase after double bonds, but here is the double bonds go af towards the positive charge. Okay, so so what do we got now? Well, that double bond is now here. You got the H, you got the E, and where's my new positive charge? Here's another double bond that I still have. Double bond, double bond, double bond. Where's the new plus charge? It's right here. And then I can, of course, push this guy right there. And now it's like... What does that look like? Well, the H and E are still there. H and E. And now this double bond's still there. This double bond's still there. Where's my new plus charge? Right there. Cool, so it's a resonance stabilized intermediate. It has some stabilization, but it's not aromatic, and that, you know, it really wants to re aromatize. Okay? Uh, the other thing about this, when we're talking about this cation, you know, like, yeah, it's not aromatic, it's resonance stabilized. Um, that second step of the EAS reaction, the second step is fast. The second step is very fast. Uh, the re -aromatization. And why do you think it's a fast step? Why do you think it's kind of a fast reaction when we look back here? Why do you think the second step is really fast? You know, this is a little bit of a slow step, initial attack to the super electrophile. But this step, going from non aromatic to aromatic, why is that fast? It's because you're making an aromatic compound, right? And aromatic compounds are super happy. So going from here to here is like a lightning bolt. It's like you make this thing and then it really quickly reacts to return back to an aromatic. Uh, Step. Okay. Um, there's a couple figures that talk about this. I'm, I'm just going to mention them. You can go look at them in the book. Figures um, 15, 19, and 15, 20. And these, these uh, show the energy profiles of, of these two steps and how, you know, you have a initial kind of slow step and then a more rapid second step. So I think there's an orbital diagram and an energy profile. 
you can go take a look at those in the book. All right. Meanwhile, we're going to show some real examples of the EAS reaction now. All right, so first one, yeah, first EAS reaction is uh, halogenation. Halogenation, which could mean for us generally, it's bromination or chlorination, but it's it's all the same, really, and mechanistically and everything. So benzene. React with Br2, kind of like you. with, you know how alkenes react with Br2? Well, aromatics react with Br2. But the big thing is alkenes, first of all, they install two bromines, right? Alkenes react with, install two bromines. But the other thing is this is not good enough. Br2 is not good enough because that's just a normal electrophile. We don't need normal electrophiles. We need what kind of electrophiles? Super electrophiles. And to make this a super electrophile, we actually have to add Br, FeBr3, iron tribromide. Okay. So, um, all right. So how does this all work mechanistically? It's a pretty easy reaction. This will also be the true for chlorine. So C, for chlorine, it's Cl2, Fe, Cl3. We'll do that in a second too. Okay, so how does this all work? So, take your, redraw your benzene. And I am going to, whenever I draw my benzenes with a specific double bond orientation, I think that's a good idea to, to copy it exactly because it, it'll, uh, you know, um, it'll make it easier to be consistent with my, with my notes. So, if I draw the benzene this way, you should copy it that way. All right. So, what happens is you draw your benzene, and then we have Br and Br. All right. And there's your Br two, right? And then it it's Br is actually talking to FeBr three. Br two is talking to FeBr three. I call this the super electrophile complex. The super electrophile complex. Okay? These two, if you just have Br2, it's just an electrophile. But now it's a super electrophile complex. Okay? So what, what was the first step? We just learned it. The last slide, right? Last page. Was the benzene just attacks. And it only attacks because it's a super electrophile complex. This stuff is kind of interacting with iron tribromide. So, sort of like this, the double bond attacks, then this jumps to make Fe, essentially FeBr4 minus, FeBr4 minus, right? You had three, now you have four. All right, so what does that make? This is our kind of intermediate cation. So I'm putting the Br right here, there's a Br. Here's an H. They're all, they all have H's. We're just not drawing all the H's, right? And what's on the neighboring position? A plus charge. And then what? What else did not change? Double bond, double bond. All right. There's also an H where the plus charge is. I'm not drawing that, and it's not really critical to draw that every time. Okay. So then, what's the base? So. I, uh, it's most likely Br minus, so we have Br minus around, and so the base is, you know, what takes off this proton to make, remake the double bond, and that is Br minus. And that regenerates the double bond, right? There's our EAS reaction. This is, the base takes the proton, all right? There is another step that we could draw if we want, and it's not really that big of a deal. FeBr4 minus, right? We'll kind of re-equilibrate re with FeBr3. 
and BR minus. And okay, so of course that's probably where this BR minus is coming from, but we we don't really care about drawing this equilibrium. We can just assume BR minus. Sometimes even just say B dot dot. For a simple step like this, B dot dot is a mild base, that's sufficient. So we'll end on chlorine, which is the same exact thing. And I'll just draw it really quickly. For halogenation, we can also do Cl2, FeCl3. Your second EAS reaction. All right, how do I draw the mechanism? So I'd redraw benzene. What do I do to that next? I take make Cl dash Cl dot 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 FeCl3. What do I say this stuff is? It's a something complex. It's a super electrophile complex. Super E plus complex. All right, and what is the benzene going to do? Attack. Bond jumps. You make FeCl4. And you got H and a Cl. Cool. Right? It is our little non aromatic thing intermediate cation. And what's the, what's the last step always? Uh, you de aromatize. Now you what aromatize? You re aromatize. So like Cl minus takes the proton, regenerates the double bond. And if we want to draw the little FeCl4 thing, we can do that. FeCl4 minus on the iron, FeCl3, Cl minus. Okay. Uh, cool. I think we are out of time. So uh, next time we'll continue this theme. And you know, there's a couple more reactions. They're all kind of similar to this. So not too crazy. A little, little bit of craziness here and there, but for the most part, you know, th this will be the uh, where we the the last little bit of chapter 15. Then it gets really cool into chapter 16, which goes a step further. All right, cool. I'll zoom out. You, you got all this right. Bromination, and there's chlorination. All right, cool.